Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. People try to say this is an idol, but you know what that is right there? It's right here. This is our sword. Part of the armor of God is the sword of the Spirit. Today we're going to be talking about the Lord is King, part 3. And it's going to call, we're calling this one the so soldier. Okay. When you get saved at Calvary, you become a soldier for Jesus Christ. Uh, part one was judgment that we did on this series. Part two was making war. And three, this part three is going to be about soldier, that you are a soldier for Jesus Christ when you get saved, when God saves you. And the evidence, we're going to talk about some things in here, there's going to be evidence of people that aren't saved. They're, why? Because they're not a soldier for Jesus Christ. What's one of the biggest things about a soldier? They take commands and follow them. Mm -hmm. But first, let's get ahead of myself a little bit. Philippians 2.25, it reads, Yet I suppose it necessary to send you to Ephroditus, my brother and companion and laborer and fellow soldier, but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants. So we see the word fellow soldier. Philemon 1 Chapter 1, verse 2 says, And to our beloved Althea and Archippus, our fellow soldiers, and to the church in thy house, fellow soldiers, people who are fighting a fight. They're doing the work of the Lord and they're warring a good warfare. This is where we see it. Uh, turn to 2 Timothy 2.1. We're going to get into this study, and the biggest things I want you guys to focus on, brothers and sisters of Christ, is that being a soldier, there's evidence that you're being a soldier. Okay, a soldier takes commands. And we're going to talk about the two be biggest commands that are given to a Christian that pretty much sums up everything. Right? But a soldier's going to fight. And we're going to use this study to kind of branch off into another series of studies. Uh, we're going to go through the whole armor of God. And we're going to compare them how each one fits together. You need the whole armor of God. Not just one or two or three. All the pieces of the armor of God. All right. So 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 1. Thou therefore, my son, be strong in, in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness, as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, no man that warreth entangleth himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Now some people will look at this and say, well that's just people that are in ministry. Uh, we're all in the ministry of reconciliation. We are all called into the ministry of reconciliation the moment you are saved. You now have a testimony. There's a changed life. You're a light for Jesus Christ to the lost world. Okay? This, I understand that oftentimes soldiers are talking about it has to do with men in ministry, but it has to do with the body of Christ as a whole when it comes to doing the work of the Lord and you're living every day as we're going to talk about this. We're living every day for Jesus Christ. You're a soldier every day. You've got to put on that whole armor of God every day. I'm getting ahead of myself. But we see two things in there. Endure hardness and entangle himself in the affairs of this life. If you're a soldier and you're warring, you're not going to let things of this world distract you from your mission, what you're focusing on. Okay? So let's, talk, let's start with endure hardness. Turn to Philippians 1.29. Okay. For unto you it is given in the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but also to suffer for His sake. To suffer for His sake. I want to throw that in there because we're talking about enduring hardness. You see there that on the behalf of Christ, not only to believe on Him, but to suffer for His, for, um, for his sake. He that suffer for me shall also reign with Him. He that suffer for Him shall also reign with Him. The Bible talks about. So we see that there's going to be suffering. 
If you're a soldier for Jesus Christ, you're going to be enduring some hardship. There's going to be some suffering. So what kind of suffering is there going to be? Okay, turn to 2 Corinthians 11.23. The best example. Okay. Now Paul never would have said this if he didn't have to make a point. I already did a study on this of uh, Corinthians where uh, Paul was speaking as a fool. He was trying to make a point. He didn't do this to brag and say, look at me, look at me, I'm, all, I'm above everybody, I'm better than everybody, and, and you guys have to obey me because of, look at me, because of me, 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 me. No. He was speaking like a fool because you had other people coming in and trying to say, look at me, look how great I am, and you guys should listen to me, not Paul, not, Paul, not Peter, you should listen to me. And they were being pulled away from the Word of God and from what Paul was preaching at the time. Okay? So let's get that understanding. But Paul does, he's honest though. He's speaking the truth of what he went through as a soldier for Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 11.23 Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And labor is more abundant. There's a lot of work to be done. One of the pieces of the armor of God is girding up your loins with truth. When you gird up your loins, it's an action. When we get through the, all the whole pieces of the armor, you're going to realize it's an action. It's a life-living action. Lifelong process. Day-to-day -day process. Okay, Girding up your loins with truth. There's two reasons you would gird up your loins. To go to work. Go to war. Those are the two reasons you did that. Okay? And that's what it says here. And laboring is more abundant. There's a lot of work to be done. And stripes above measures. He was whipped. And prisons more frequent. And deaths oft. Let that one sink in. Okay? We always thought that, you know, Paul talks about going to the third heaven, uh, going up there. And it talks about how he was stoned once. We always say, well, he died and God brought him back and said, I'm not done with you yet. you still got work for me to do. But here it says, in deaths often. Oft. Okay. That's a whole other study, but something to think about. Verse 24. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. There's the part where he was stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. And journeys often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, and perils by mine own countrymen, your family members. I mean, if you go through this and try to apply it to you, brother, sister, Christ, there's a lot of things you go through. Robbers, you lose your job because you're a Christian and you stand for the Word of God. Okay, You lose family members. People turn on you. And perils by the heathen, when you were a lost, like I'll tell you right now, when I was a lost, false convert, claiming to be a Christian, but as a false convert, the lost heathen world loved me. They didn't have a problem with me. When I got saved and started putting on that whole armor of God and became a soldier for Jesus Christ, the lost world started looking at me differently. They started treating me differently. Okay? In perils among the heathens, in perils in the city. Okay? Nowadays, it, I go into the city to, to do my shopping and do what I have to do, and I come back home because it is so wicked in the city, and they hate Christians in the city. Okay? But let's keep reading. And perils in the wilderness. You mean they hate Christians in the wilderness too? Oh yeah. It doesn't matter where you go. They're going to hate Christians. You're going to be fighting a fight, a war. Okay? Now, I understand in some of these cities where there's rioting going on, there's just utter destruction. If it's possible for you to move to another city that's safer, by all means, go for it. But this big push that we, we all need to just go out into the countryside and live out in the countryside, uh, God's got us where, we want, where He wants us. We're supposed to be soldiers for Jesus Christ. Okay, We're supposed to be warring a good warfare. We're not supposed to be tucking tail and running every second. Okay? 
I just want to put that out there and encourage the brethren. If you're somewhere where you're like, okay, God's got me here, the door's still open, and I'm still preaching the gospel and everything, and things are getting kind of rough, but the doors are still open and God's still using me here, you need to stay there and serve the Lord and be a, and be a good soldier. Okay? If the doors are closed, by all means, get out of there. Move to another city to where the doors are still open. Or... You can move out. I live on the mountainside, or you can live out in the countryside. There's nothing wrong with any of this. But right here, Paul just says it doesn't matter where you are. If you're in the city, you're going to have perils. You're going to be doing, going through some hardship, some suffering. All right. And peril, okay, and perils in the wilderness, and perils in the sea. I would. I was joking with some person, uh, a, a brother and sister in Christ, about. Uh, all the fires that are going on here, it's like they're saying, any direction we go, there's tons of smoke. And I was joking about the ocean here. It's like, get on a boat and go out 50 miles and just sit there, you know. But try to get away from the smoke that was here a week ago. But honestly, Paul says, you're not going to get away from it as a, being a soldier. You're not going to get away from the perils and the persecution and the war that goes on, the hardship that goes on with being a Christian today. You're not going to get away with it. Whether you're living in the city, whether you're living in the wilderness, whether you're out on a boat on the sea, doesn't matter. Okay, there's going to be perils. And perils among false brethren. That's the biggest peril I see today more than anything, brothers and sisters in Christ. We've got so many false converts trying to come in and try to claim that they're Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women, and their goal is to prevent people from getting saved and to mess up Christians that are saved. Time and time again I've seen this. I've done other studies. I've talked about wolves in sheep's clothing. Uh, but it says here, in perils among false brethren. Okay, When you put on the whole armor of God and you step out there to be a soldier for Jesus Christ, you're going to look around and say, wait a second, there's some people standing here that their armor doesn't look right. Wait a minute. They're not, they're not one of us. They're not fighting. They're against us. They're not fighting for, with us, for us. They're against us. You're going to see that. Okay, perils among false brethren. Here it is, in weariness and painfulness. Okay, every day fighting the flesh, putting the flesh down, bringing your thoughts, every thoughts into the obedience of Christ. I mean, my thoughts stray a lot and I've really got to rein them in to stay focused on the Lord, on what I'm supposed to be doing today and whatnot. Okay. It's weariness, okay? Studiness, much study is a weariness to the flesh, the Bible says. And painfulness, okay? We have to go back to the old past. That's what I've been doing. I have a garden. I've been trying to hunt. I've been trying to fish. Okay, I've been doing a lot of work on this property to stay busy. Um, you get away from all the fun and easy ways of doing things, the quick ways, and you start realizing the old paths are better. They keep you busy. It's a good thing to stay busy, but it's weariness. Brothers and Christ, when you get into ministry and you're preaching the word, and there's times where it feels like nobody's listening, and I know there's brothers and sisters in Christ out there listening, but hear what I'm saying. When you feel like lately, like you're getting more attacks in the comment section than people saying, "Oh, what about this verse?" Like it feels like I'm reaching people when they say, "Hey, what about this verse?" Oh, I love the verse you used there, and. Man, this was amazing teaching because it helped me here in my life, and, yet, and you show that it's applying, they're applying it to their lives. That's a real encouragement to those of us in ministry. But it's a weariness sometimes. There's days, brothers and sisters of Christ, I'm sitting here going, Lord, is there, there's so few of us out there, you know. You just get so weariness. You get wearied. And watchings often, okay, and hungers and thirst. There, there's some people that have lost their jobs recently because they refuse to wear the masks uh, and their jobs and everything because it's unhealthy. It doesn't help you and it's unhealthy. And, they, and their body is a temple for the Holy Ghost and the Bible says that it's supposed to be without blemish. You're supposed to take care of your body. You're supposed to eat healthy. You're supposed to exercise. You're going to take care of your body. You're not supposed to be getting piercings left and right. You're not supposed to get tattoos left and right. You got piercings and you get saved, you get rid of the piercings. You take the piercings out. Okay? Uh, the tattoos, you cover them up. You don't let the world see it. And, and, and what the Bible talks about, whose glory is in their shame, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. You're not supposed to glory in your shame. 
You hide them. But your body is a temple for the Holy Ghost. Okay? A lot of times you're going to go through hunger and through thirst. And fasting is often. Okay? And cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily. This is a daily thing for him. Okay? I've never been through what Paul's been through completely. I've been through some of these things. I can relate to some of these things. But he went through a lot, brothers and sisters of Christ, being a soldier for Jesus Christ. It says there, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of the whole church. And as we read through here, we're going to read some things where he's crying night and day with tears because of his care for the whole church. And it's a day-to-day -day thing. I'm worried about the church, brothers and sisters of Christ. I'm worried about you, brothers and sisters of Christ, to stand in these last days. So many people keep falling away. So many people keep breaking fellowship. Getting distracted by the world. They're not putting on that whole armor of God. Okay? They're forgetting to sometimes. So there we see endure hardness. It's suffering. And what things are you going to go through? We just listed all those things. You have to, be in a Bible-believing, God-fearing man woman, you have to be able to relate to some of those things. You have to. If you can't relate to any of those things, chances are you either have the wrong armor on, I keep saying that because when we get further into study, you realize that you could tell certain armies of certain countries by the type of armor they wore. Oh yeah. And you could tell the enemy by the armor they wore. Okay, you have a Frenchman, you have a German, you have an Englishman, on and on and on. Okay. The Spanish conquistadors and so like that. They all had separate armor to a point where you could tell the difference. So, that if you can't relate to any of that stuff, I'd check your relationship with the Lord. Okay? What with with, uh, Paul says in 1 and 2 Corinthians, I think it's 1 Corinthians, where he says, check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. You need to check whether you be in the faith if you can't relate to any of that stuff. When you become a soldier for Jesus Christ, and you start putting on that whole armor of God, not just parts of it that you feel like putting on, the, the whole armor of God, you're going to start going through those things. Okay. Next part in 2 Timothy chapter 2, where it said, Entangled himself with the affairs of this life. No man that warreth, he's fighting a warfare, entangleth himself with the affairs of this life. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. Turn to Matthew chapter 26. No, 24, Matthew 6, 24. I hear the rain. It's raining, praise the Lord. I'm sorry. I'm reading it wrong. Matthew 6, 24. If I said it wrong, then I said it wrong. I apologize. If I said it right, then I went to the wrong place. 6.24. I'm having a hard time lately reading numbers. I'm getting them mixed up. Matthew 6.24. I was at 24.6. I switched them around. Six, Matthew 6.24. No man can serve two masters, for he will either hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Stop there for a second. The reason I read those verses is, like I said, you have an armor of God. There's a lot of people who wear armor, but are they wearing the armor of God? There's some people trying to uh, serve two masters, and you can't. And how do you spot them? When we go over the study about the whole armor of God, you'll be able to spot people that, hey, that's not the right armor. Okay? They're not a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. They're a fake. They're a fraud. They're working for the enemy. Okay? Verse 25. Therefore I say unto you, because some people are worried and it's all about riches and getting things, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, that ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? 
Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking a thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought for raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, they toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? Bottom line, one of the things that can distract you and tangle himself with the affairs of his life, one of the things that can distract you, brother and sister Christ, from being a good soldier for Jesus Christ is the cares of this world. You start getting into money things, and it becomes about, well, I've got to have this, and I've got to have... Do you have clothes on your back? Praise the Lord. Do you get have enough food to eat at least one meal a day? Praise the Lord. Okay. Don't let those things get in the way. So that's one of the things that it's entangle the affairs of this life. That's one of the things that I'll see with some brethren where they're going through some hard times so we need to be there for one another and we need to help one another. Absolutely, praise the Lord. But we need to realize that we're still soldiers for Jesus Christ and sometimes a soldier's got to fight through. What did Paul say that he went through? Hunger and thirst? Nakedness? Through cold and nakedness? There's times you're going to go through some hard times. Okay. My biggest thing is, is I don't, I'm not purposely trying to do this, but I live poor. God has blessed me with a retirement and income every month, but I live poor for a reason. At any moment, God can say, you're going to go through some hard times for me. And those that are living it up and living lavishly, the Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women out there, you, that are living just lavishly and you might do well to try to tone it down a little bit. Live poor. Even though you're not poor, live a little poor. Okay? I know some people might attack me for that, but I'm, it's changed my life. Okay? I eat uh, two meals a day. I was able to get rid of a lot of things that I don't use and I don't need. And I'm able to be content. Here we're going to read in 1 Timothy 6.8. It says, And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. When I start downing down things, uh, dumbing down things, if not dumbing down, but how do you say it? Toning down things where I don't have to go out and spend money left and right. And I start giving up bad, uh, had, uh, bad addictions that were expensive. Video games, movies, television. Okay, getting rid of cable every month. Save me 40 something dollars a month now. Um, you know, I don't do video games anymore or movies. Right. Get rid of all the secular music. I just listen to uh, wordless music or old hymns. God's given me good things to do with my hand. The garden, learning how to do the plants where they reseed and you collect the seeds and then you replant again next year. Uh, walking on the beach and talking with the Lord. Right. Collecting things on the beach. He's taught me how to do things where I'm not so distracted anymore and I'm not so dependent anymore on all this stuff that I need. I don't hardly go out to eat at all anymore. Okay? Uh, I cook my own food. Raw foods and um, you know, vegetables, fruits, meat that I've caught, fish that I've caught myself. I still have lots of bear meat in there. That's kind of going off a little bit, but just as a warning to the brethren out there, you think, well, I'm doing really good and I'm doing great. It never hurts to always live mediocre. You know? It never does, okay? Because the hard times, we could go through a lot of hard times before the catching away of the body of Christ. I'm not for teaching any teaching that says we can be here for another two months, another six months, another year. I don't like it when people try to push forward the catching away of the body of Christ because then people start taking their eyes off Jesus Christ and putting it on the world. And what are we talking about here? The cares of this world. They entangle themselves with the affairs of this life. You start getting entangled with the affairs of this life when you take your eyes off Jesus Christ. We should be teaching and preaching that Jesus can come back 
right here, right now, while I'm doing this video, today, he could come back. Okay? Is your life that you're living something that God is proud of? Or do you have a lot of work still to go? Okay? That's what it means to look for Jesus Christ every day. But we need to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ every day. And when you take your eyes off Jesus Christ and you start looking at the world and the cares of this world, that's when you usually start getting entangled. And what happens when you get entangled in something? It stops you from moving forward. It can sometimes cause you to trip and fall. Okay. So, turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 20. Another thing cares of this world, another thing in this world that the enemy likes to use to distract you from focusing on your mission. Okay, we talked about the basics. Food, clothing, roof over your head. All right? uh, we could go through some hard times where you won't have, be able to live as lavishly as you normally do. All right? I'll be honest with you, I, live, I have very little clothes, but the reason I have little of the clothes is I've always hated shopping. I've always hated it. And now that I'm saved, I hate going into town and going shopping. Because there's so much wickedness that gets put in front of your eyes when you're trying to go in and just do some simple shopping. But that's the way that God's helped me be content with food and raiment. Mm -hmm. But turn to 2 Corinthians 12, 20. Is that the only thing that can distract you from the cares of this world? For I fear, lest when I come, I shall not find you such as I would. Right? He will find you not such as I would. In other words, you're not, for the study, you're not having the whole armor of God on. You're not picking up that cross daily. You're not focusing on Jesus Christ, because when you're focusing on Jesus Christ, it's about His commands and it's about His Word. Am I doing everything right? Am I doing things I'm not supposed to do? Am I making my stands for the right things? Okay. But I find you such as I would, that I should be found unto you such as you would not, lest there be debates. You can be entangled with debates, and it can just deter you from doing the work of the Lord. You've heard stories where people used to go door to door and they would preach. And I, I talk to people about the word of the Lord on when I walk on the beach. I give out gospel tracts everywhere I go. When I go for walking, sometimes with some of the neighbors I can get into it really trying to talk about the word of the Lord. But there's times i got to realize that when it becomes a debate, they're distracting me from the mission. When you're preaching the gospel, the plan of salvation, when you realize that person's not ready... How do you know they're not ready? Uh, they're, they're not broken. They don't want to repent. And they're just going to sit there and they're going to try to debate with you. You don't want to fall back into that. Why? That's entangling yourself with the affairs of this life. Okay? It's slowing you down. It's stopping you from the mission. Okay? Uh, what's the mission? Uh, to be, re be reconciled unto Christ. Okay? We're all part of the ministry of reconciliation. I was once the enemy of Christ. Brother and sister in Christ, you were once the enemy of Christ. Now we've been reconciled and we are friends. Our job is to go out there with, and shot our feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Preach the plan of salvation to the world. And we're mainly preaching it to the world as a whole, but our main goal, brother and sister, I keep pointing at my eyes, is we're looking for those that want it. Do you want it? No. Okay, I'm going over here. Do you want it? No, I'm going over here. Do you, oh, you want it? Okay, this is where I'm going to spend my time, most of my time. That's what we got to do. And you can get distracted with debates. Envyings. Getting you to envy one another. Wraths. You know, a lot of the fighting and arguing that's going along among the, uh, these false brethren out there that love to attack this ministry, and they love to attack... Uh, they, let, they just love to attack God's ministry, men of God, and they love to attack His Word. And the thing that just makes me shake my head a lot is, you look at these people, and if they, if they could, they turn, and they, you have seen them, turn on each other. It's such wrath, they just turn on each other, and their whole uh, YouTube channel is just about mocking, making fun of, belittling. Uh, we're going to get into the backbiting here. It says stripes, backbitings whisperings, you know, gossip, lies, and everything, and that's the, all they're about. They're not soldiers for Jesus Christ, okay? They're not. 
We, can, we cannot fall into that trap of doing that, brothers and sisters of Christ. Okay? Uh, swellings, tumults. See how far we're going. 21. And lest, when I come again, because now he's correcting them yet again, notice who he's talking to, the Corinthians, you've got people, false converts come in that are getting them into debates, getting them into envyings, getting them into wraths, getting them into strifes, they're getting them to backbite, they're getting them to whisperings, okay? Swellings, tumults, they're distracting the body of Christ. They profess to be Christians, they come in, they're false converts, and they distract the body of Christ. You get entangled with the affairs of this life. 21. Unless when I come again, my God will humble me among you, and that I shall be well many which have sinned already. Be well many which have sinned already, and have not repented of the uncleanness and fornication and lasciviousness which they have committed. That's why the Bible says, abstain from all appearance of evil. That's why there's guidelines for breaking fellowship with a brother in Christ that's justifying sin. They fall into sin. They don't want to let go of that sin. They love that sin. You can't have that in your life. Okay? They've got to be put out of your fellowship until they repent, and then they can come back in. The lost world. You can help the lost world out. I help my neighbors out all the time. I share eggs with neighbors. Sometimes I'll get fruit and vegetables from some of the neighbors uh, in trade. But I don't go and indulge in the sin that they're, in, they're sinning in. I have neighbors that invite family over. They have parties where they have secular style music. They have alcohol. their cigarettes. And I have nothing to do with that. I can't have that in my life. Okay. Repent. Okay. He's coming there and he's finding a lot of people that are doing all this stuff. And look how they're living. Fornication. Lasciviousness. And they're not repenting. How many of you know people like that? Professing, Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women. How many people? How many of you know people like that? I do. What do you got to do? God, I give them to you, and you put them out. Sometimes they can be saved. But oftentimes they're not. Okay? You hit me up with the sin that I'm doing according to Scripture, and you can back it with Scripture, I've always told people, your first thought sometimes might be you're so embarrassed and you're so ashamed of that sin that you put up a shield and you put up a, a wall to try to def and get defensive at first. But later you come back and you're like, you're right, I shouldn't have been doing that. I, that, just so, that sin there, I should not have been doing that. Lord, forgive me. Brother, forgive me for treating you the way I did. And I want to get this out of my life. Lord, get this out of my life, please. I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. All right. So those things, when you look through those things, I had to put those things in there when it comes to the affairs of this life. That's what the lost world does. That's what the lost world loves doing. All those things that we talked about. And if you get sidetracked and snared by that, it's going to slow you down. You're going to be almost useless for the, for the Lord and for the work of the Lord. You're not going to be much help to the brethren either. All right. The number one reason you have all these, I also want to throw this in there, everything we just read there, debating, envyings, wrath, strife, backbiting, whispering, swelling, tumults, okay, it says the number one reason you have all these is because of the desire to justify sin and keep it. That's why I said sometimes, very rarely, you might come across a brother that, like I said, they get very defensive at first, but later they're going to come back. The Holy Spirit's going to convict them, they're going to be convicted by their own conscience, and the Lord might even get to the point of chastising them. But they're going to come, come forward and say, you know what, you're right. The people that really love this stuff is the people that love to justify their sin. You'll find them doing all this stuff. You look at their, their so-called ministry, these wolves in sheep's clothing out there. You look at their ministries out there, and look, it's all about all this stuff. Oh, yeah. Notice there it says in verse... Um, 21, it says, I shall bewail many. Where else is Paul crying? We're going to get to that verse, but it's, he's crying night and day with tears when he's warning us about wolves in sheep's clothing coming in to mess the Christians up, to scatter the flock. He cries night, never ceases to, no, he says, he never ceases to warn us night and day with tears. 
we see that again. That's how serious it was with the Corinthians. You had saved and lost coming together, uniting as one. We're all Christians. We're all brothers and sisters in Christ. Because they come in with a false plan of salvation. Only believe. You can keep your sin. You can live however you want. You can do whatever you want. And what happened? They're trying to get the Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women to take off that armor of God, to stop being a soldier for Jesus Christ, and then they get start getting, and those people that are truly saved start getting messed up. You start losing testimonies. You become useless for the Lord and the mission. Okay, you, you're no good to fight any war. Okay? You're not doing any work. You're useless. Okay? Turn to Titus 3.8. Three eight starts over here. Here we here here we see it again. Okay, in Corinthians, you see all this stuff going on because they're doing it to just I believe to justify sin, and they're trying to mess up Christians that are truly saved, prevent people from getting saved, mess up those who are saved, so God can't use them other than as a bad example. Okay, here's another time we see in Titus two eight says this is a faithful saying in these. And these things I will that thou art affirmed constantly, affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. A little bit of a side note, brothers and sisters of Christ, what really irritates me is I'm trying to point out to you, brothers and sisters of Christ, that maintain good works, be careful to maintain good works. And you and I are, and you, brothers and sisters of Christ, are like, yes, I'm trying my best to do good works. But what irritates me is these false converts that come in and they say, they pick on little words like, be careful. It says, be careful to. It doesn't say you have to maintain. But where's their heart at? Why isn't it your heart's desire to maintain good works? You start looking at them. They're not wearing the right armor. They're trying to pretend. They're trying to weasel their way into the body of Christ and say, I'm a Christian. But you look at them, they're not wearing the right armor. Their heart's desire should be to do good, maintain good works, according to Scripture. Their heart's desire is to obey the Word of God and His commands. I'm getting ahead of myself, but remember, Jesus said, If a man love me, he'll keep my words. There's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend, but ye, ye are my friends if ye do whatsoever I command you. Right? It says here, Believe that they which believe in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto, unto men. See, it's just good and profitable. It doesn't mean you have to. What are we doing? We're going back under those people that are trying to debate, get into arguments with you. They're all, all that stuff we read up there, debates, envyings, wrath, strifes, backbiting, whispering, swelling, tumults. It's all about justifying sin so they can keep it. Anybody that tries to tell you, when you read something that says good works, um, in Ephesians uh, 8, 2, 8, 9, and 10, when you get to 10, it says, For ye are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which have, with four been ordained that ye should walk in them. They always say, it says you should walk in them. It doesn't mean you have to. It means you should. And my thing is, their hearts, what their heart is, is their heart is for the, we don't have to. Why isn't their heart towards the, I should be doing this. The Bible says I'm supposed to be doing it. I better make sure I should be doing this. Their heart's not like that. Okay? You start looking at them closer, they're not wearing the armor of God. They're wearing the armor of this world. Okay? They're, they're of their father, the devil. Okay? They're fighting on the devil's side. Nine. But here's things that also can entangle you in this life. Okay? In the affairs of this life. But avoid... Foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. We want to see how far we're going. And vain. Verse 10. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Brothers and sisters of Christ, this book will shine a light on people. 
and you look at people, and like they say, these are glasses that I'm wearing, and you're looking at people through the Word of God. Okay, there's the armor of God. That's not the armor of God. He's not even wearing any armor. What? And, and you start going through, and it starts pointing people out. What's going on here? A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Why? Knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth and being condemned of himself. They condemn themselves. Eventually, I've known that, brethren, that there's people out there that can talk the talk. I learned the hard way. The hard, hard way. That there's people out there that can talk the talk, but they don't walk the walk. The Bible says, what, um, whether in word or in deed, do all in the name of Jesus Christ. It takes both. Their words and their deeds have to line up. But when you back someone in the corner with their sin, and you, anything you see in the Bible says, uh, what you're saying doesn't line up with the Word of God. And the way you're living your life and what you're doing there, and you start backing them in the corner, mainly with their sin, their words are going to start changing. Their deeds don't line up with their words. You back them in the corner with their deeds, their words start lining up with their deeds. You're going to see this. What happens? They start being condemned of themselves. But as we saw up there, avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law. Okay? For they are unprofitable and vain. People got, I got, someone got upset at me at one of the comment sections because I told him, I said, hey, what you just said there was a straw man argument. It was a straw man question. You believe this, therefore this. And I'm like, that's a straw man argument. You're trying to say what I believe when it's not what I believe at all. Therefore, what you say over here automatically is right because what you say over here lines up with over here. Those are foolish questions. Don't waste your time with people like that. They have straw man arguments, straw man questions. You know? Said, so, since the car is blue, such and such, but the car was red. You see what I'm saying? So because it was blue, then it can, it, it's like the water in the ocean, and it makes it look like it's the same thing. And he's telling the truth. But you're looking back, the first part, I know I threw something stupid out there, but the car was red. Or if the car was green or yellow, it wasn't blue. They always make something definitive that this is how it is, therefore, this is how it goes. Avoid foolish questions like that. Okay, that's one of the biggest ones that you've realized that they are foolish questions. Okay. Now, two things I've got to point out here also. When we read in verse 9 where it says it's unprofitable and vain, why did it use both words? It says that it's unprofitable and it's vain. Let me explain why. Unprofitable doesn't mean vain. I spent a hundred dollars on materials and I built something then I turned around and sold it for a hundred dollars they call it breaking even I broke even but was it profitable it was unprofitable now let's go on that same situation I spent a hundred dollars on materials I built something and basically couldn't even give it away I lost $100. It was worthless. That's why it uses both words, okay? When you get into foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and striving about the law, it's not that it's just not unprofitable like you're always going to break even. It's vain. It's worthless. That's why God chose both those words, because someone can say unprofitable. Well, it was unprofitable. I sat there with the guy for a while and, and answered. He just kept having you know, these straw man arguments and these foolish questions, and I spent hours and hours answering. And it's like, well, I think I might have just broke even. you know. No, this says it's not just unprofitable, but it's also vain. Vain means worthless. You wasted your time. More important, it's more accurate to say that man wasted your time. That'd be the more accurate way of saying it. But those are ways that you can be entangled with the affairs of this life. You're supposed to be a soldier. You've got a mission. Okay. There's people that are asking sincere questions. Answer those questions. But there's times where people that look like they're asking questions and being sincere, you start answering some of their questions, and they come back with more questions. And then the more questions they come back with, they're more like straw man. They're more like they're trying to pull you away from the truth. Okay. 
Someone once said that you have people that ask questions because they want answers. And then you have people that ask questions just to ask questions. They're not, ask, they're not seeking answers. They're trying to mess you up. They're trying to trip you up in your words. They're trying to pull you away from the truth. Okay. 2 Timothy, 2, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 23 says, But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strife. Okay. What did we read up there? About uh, debates, envyings, wraths, strifes in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. They do, uh, when you do foolish and unlearned questions, avoid knowing that they do gender strife. Yeah, they're going to cause strife and it's going to entangle you and it's going to pull you away from the mission at hand. From doing the work of the Lord. From living for the Lord every day. Okay, from fighting the good fight, the good warfare. It's like God says, okay, I need everybody to meet here. You start going there and you run into somebody. It starts hitting you with up all these questions. And you realize, okay, they're full of questions. Out of my way. And you keep going. I'm not saying you hit them, but I'm talking about like, get them out of your way. Because God says, we need everybody here. We need everybody here. You keep going. And then you hit somebody else who starts, you know, using straw man arguments. We, we were at foolish questions or starting to argue with genealogy. They try to use debates and envyings. Sorry, out of the way. And then you keep running. This is where God wants me. That's the mission. Okay, we're all here. Let's start doing the work of the Lord. Okay, that's what I'm talking about, entangled in this life. You can start going there, and all of a sudden you get hungry, and you're like, you know what? The Lord will take care of me, and you keep making it here. You don't go, oh, I'm hungry, so I'm going to go over here. And, oh, now I don't have enough money, and, and I'm going to try to work over here, and I'm going to try to buy this food. And, oh, this jacket looks cool. I already have a jacket, but that jacket. And you start following over here, and you're not getting to where God wants you. The war is here. The fight is here. But you're way over here. That's what it means by being entangled in the affairs of this life. You're way over here, and you need to be here, fighting the good fight. Okay. Um, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 3 also reads, As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. Teach no other doctrine. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies. There we see the endless genealogies. It also talks about fables, okay, which minister questions rather than godly edifying, which is in faith, so do. Which minister questions. When you have fables, there's a lot of questions. That's why the base, I'm going to upset some people, but with the Trinity, it's pagan. It's not biblical, and it's made to be confusing, so it gender, gets people to ask questions. Okay. Questions that can never be answered because they're not based in Scripture. Capital T Trinity is not a title for God in the Bible. That should end it right there. I'm not believing in the Trinity. I'm only going to believe in the Godhead. That should end it right there for anybody that's a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman. But does it? No. People start coming in and start doing uh, uh, foolish questions. And they try to pull you away from the Word of God. And the Word of God is no longer your final authority. Mankind is. They try to disarm you and take that sword away. And now you can't fight. You're no good. Without that sword, you can't fight. Okay? That's one of the good ones, you know, for fables. That's a fable. Okay? The Trinity, oh, that's biblical. It's a fable. It's paganism. You can't find capital T Trinity in the Bible. You won't find God in three persons in the Bible. It will never you show me one scripture where it says God in three persons. Show me where God the Father is called a person. I'm waiting for him to throw that one verse up where it's talking about Jesus Christ, but lately people have been trying to say, well, no, it's talking about God the Father. No, it's Jesus Christ is the, is the person. It's his person. It's talking about Jesus Christ, not God the Father. Show me where it says the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is a person. The Bible has to call him a person before you say he's a person. You don't just get to add to Scripture and say, well, it uses the word he and the. It uses the word he for goats. He goats, she goats, he asses, she asses, for donkeys. Okay? That doesn't make him a person. An animal's not a person. Okay? So just because they use the word he or she doesn't mean that that means it's a person. You're adding to scripture when you say that. 
It's that simple, but I can get off on that anyway. The fables, okay, they get up, they start, how many of you, I'll go back on it for just a little bit. How many of you have been distracted from doing the work of the Lord because you get to arguing and debating with these Trinitarians? These Bible perverters, these Bible perversion users. We'll go off the Trinity, go on to something else, else. Bible perversion users. We try to show them that the King James Bible is God's perfect written word, and they won't listen. Uh, dispensational teaching. They, tr they just like to debate and backbite and ask foolish questions. You've answered that question, yet they'll answer it again, thinking they can word it differently, and you'll get a different, they'll get a different answer, because they worded the question differently. I've come across those people. Okay. Notice it says, fables and endless genealogies, which minister questions rather than godly edifying. It doesn't edify the body of Christ. Okay, It doesn't help you, and it doesn't edify God. You're not doing the work of the Lord at that point. Okay, You're being distracted and pulled away from doing the work of the Lord. Okay. Matthew 23, 24 says, Ye blind guides which strain at a gnat and swallow at a camel. Those are those people you're dealing with. Okay? They strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. If you show them absolute truth, and the bottom line comes down to this, they don't want it. They don't want absolute truth. They love their sin. They love the life they're living. They want to go to heaven when they die. Who wants to go to hell? I don't know of any one person. I mean, there's some people that are really, that they will say, I would love to go to hell because they're just so mentally ill. But I'm talking about anybody with, that's not mentally ill, they're going to be like, I want to go to heaven. I don't want to go to hell. Okay, that means uh, throwing the old man and the old woman at the foot of the cross. That means coming to the cross broken, having godly sorrow for your personal sins that you've sinned against them. That godly sorrow, sorrow towards God. Oh, I can't do that. I love my sin. You mean after salvation there's a changed life? We talked about that. Good works. I can't do that. I love my sin. I love my lost life. They like to go to heaven. But they don't want to go to they don't want to go to hell, but they don't want to obey the gospel. We're almost there to that. The first command that you're given as a Christian, as a soldier for Jesus Christ, is to obey the gospel. It happens before salvation. You're, you're given that command. We're looking for soldiers. Come on in. And there's that command, obey the gospel. In order to be a soldier for Jesus Christ, you've got to obey the gospel. And where do we live off here? Here we are. Okay, so we are moving on to it. Next part, a soldier follows commands. So we're going to get into the soldier part again. Please, brothers and sisters of Christ, with everything we just read there, I know there's a lot more we could have gone over. But there's a lot of things in this life that can distract you from being a good soldier for Jesus Christ. you got to understand, being a good soldier for Jesus Christ is there's going to be a lot of hardship. We read what Paul went through. Okay, There's a lot of hardship that you're going to go through as a Christian. Okay, It's just the way it is. Okay? A lot of people think, well, I'll be a soldier. It's going to be fun, right? It's going to be fun. And they, and they get in there. Remember that study I did, Brother Jesus Christ, where you have all these people saying, hey, I'll be a Christian. And they get in there and it's like, wait a minute. This isn't what I signed up for. And it wasn't. You know, one of the seeds that fall down and then it springs up really quick. Hey, being a Christian, it'll be fun, right? It'll be fun. But it has no root and withers away. What is that? You know, by and by they are offended. People always take that about, they, they, won't, they don't want to stand for the Word of God because of the pressure from the world. That teaching we did, no, sometimes it's called, I'd love to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or, or woman that's out there. I'd love to be that. And when they get into it, they realize, I wasn't told everything. And, you know, those people that promised them, the Bible talks about in Second Peter, promising them liberty, but they themselves are the servants of corruption. You know, I would love to be a Bible-believing Christian. And they get into it and they realize, what, I have to have a changed life? Nobody told me I had to have a changed life. What, repentance? I never repented. This isn't what I signed, you mean I have to give up this? And I, this isn't what I signed up for. And it isn't. Okay. Brother and sister Christ, you know, those of us who are truly saved, born again, understand that there are hardships out there for us. We're going to go through hard times. Okay. There's things in this world that's always going to be trying to ensnare us. But through it all, God will give you peace and joy. We'll talk about that. God will give you peace and joy. But now we're moving on to soldiers. Uh, a soldier follows commands. 
So when you're looking at someone who claims to be a Bible-believing, God-fearing man or woman, and they're supposed to be a soldier for Jesus Christ, are they following God's commands? Okay, a soldier follows commands. What's their attitude about following commands, period, in general? Je following Jesus Christ's word in general? Okay. Do, what happens? I'll warn you here. We go back to the entangling thing. They'll try to entangle you. What does God's word say? Well, yea, hath God said, and feelings and opinions, and twisting scripture, and so on and so forth. Don't let them entangle you. But a soldier follows commands. John 15.10 Turn to John 15.10. We're going to read to 14. If you keep my commandments, there's a Bible if, there's a condition. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. A lot of people don't like that. Right there. Uh, there's no greater love than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. I died for my friends. Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Here we read it again. If you keep my commandment, you shall abide in my love. It's only natural that when someone gets truly saved and born again, they're going to say, Lord, command me. Tell me what to do. Change my life. Come in. Take over. Clean up this wretchedness that's here. He had a lot of work to do on me. But here we see it again. And these people that attack change life gospel, it's because they love their sin. The old woman, the old man still kicking. is alive and kicking. Never was crucified with Christ. Even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. God will give you joy. Like I said, there's going to be hardships. You're going to be struggling with not being entangled with the affairs of this life. But through it all, God's going to give you joy. Okay? There's going to be peace. Verse 12. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. There we see it again. Okay? Evidence of salvation. You're going to do whatever God commands you. You're a friend of Jesus. What stops it of being a friend of Jesus? The enemy of Jesus. You can't serve two masters. We read that verse. Okay? Either you're the friend of Jesus, or you're the enemy of Jesus. You can't be both. And there's so many people that are trying to be both. You can't be both. Right? People attacking me. That verse right there, you read all the way down, starting from the top there where it says, If you keep my commandments, you, have, you shall abide in my love. And we're going to get to the first commandment, and the first commandment is obey the gospel. He died for his friends. Anybody can be a friend of Jesus Christ. I'm not saying only specific people can be the friend of Jesus. Anybody can get saved today. Brothers and sisters in Christ, you and I are the biggest examples. We look at our lives and say, wow, God saved me. It's, it's a miracle. The life that you were living, it's a miracle. God saved you. Okay, it wasn't like, oh, I was chosen from the foundation of the world as far as um, predestinated, as far as the Calvinists believe. No, anybody can be a friend of Jesus Christ. But most people won't want, don't want to be. They're going to choose the uh, broad is the way that leads to destruction, narrow is the way that leads to life, everlasting life, but broad is the way that leads, basically, the path that leads to hell. People don't want to be the friend of Jesus Christ. But we read there, uh, if you... If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. Now, it's a condition. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. What's the opposite of that? If you break my commandments, you are not abiding in my love. Now, I understand, brother, sister Christ, that a Christian can struggle with sin and fall away and fall into sin and temptation. Fall into temptation. I got corrected by a brother. 
and they choose to sin, and they, and they get on the Lord's bad side, if you want to say it that way. And they get chastised. Or they can get convicted and get back on the right trail without chastisement. But the point is, is I understand people can fall into sin as a saved sinner. But what this is talking about, I believe, is talking about the heart's desire. Okay? My heart's desire is to obey the commandments of God. To obey His Word. And when I fail the Lord, I feel miserable. I have no peace. I have no joy. We just read about the joy there. I have no joy. When I start taking off pieces of that armor and putting it to the side and start falling, get, start going in, giving into the flesh and start sinning, choosing to sin, I'm miserable. My heart's desire is not for that. My heart's desire is for the commandments of God, to obey the commandments of God. Right? And when I am doing my best to obey God's commandments, we have joy, brothers and sisters of Christ, and peace. Right? We're not given a spirit of fear, but of peace and of a sound mind. I hope I said that right. right? Yeah. We're supposed to, the fear comes when we start failing the Lord. That's where the fear comes, and we're supposed to fear God. We are supposed to be in fear when we start choosing to sin and straying away, taking off that armor of God, putting down that sword, putting down that shield. Okay? Oh, the cross, I left it by my bedside. I really didn't pick it up this morning. The Bible says you're supposed to pick up your cross daily and follow Jesus. Okay? John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. The Word of God. Okay? We will love him. We see it again up there. It says in John 15, 10 that we just read there. It said, If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love. John 14, 23 says, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my Father will love him. What's the opposite? If you don't keep his words, God's love's not on you. And I'm not talking about work, because they're going to say it's works-based salvation. No, it isn't. When you get saved, your heart's desire is to please God. That's why we were created. You're going to serve God, you're going to obey God. That's your heart's desire. You're going to fail Him sometimes. You're going to fall flat on your face. We talked about getting entangled with this world. You're going to trip and fall flat on your face sometimes. Knock out some teeth. Go through some hard times. Uh, there's, uh, God will forgive you of your sins, but sometimes the, sin, the scars of those sins are still going to be there. Sometimes you're going to knock out, fall flat on your face and knock some teeth out. All right? But your desire, your heart's desire is to keep the Word of God. A true soldier for Jesus Christ wants to obey the Word of God and obey His commands and keep His Word. That's his heart's desire. That's his life. His whole life's desire. Or hers. Okay? That's the whole point I'm pointing at here, brothers and sisters of Christ. A soldier follows commands. Evidence of salvation. You're a soldier for Jesus Christ, and your attitude towards this book is this is God's perfect written word, the King James Bible. People keep hitting me up. Well, that's an idol. That's an idol. They're lost. This is not an idol. This is just to remind myself and anybody who's watching, that it's God's words, which we're talking about right here, God's commands over the world's commands. I don't know if you can see it. I kind of crunch down, and I'll move over here like this. But you see all these Bible perversions down here, and the world's religions, and what the world thinks, and what the world wants. Ye can be as God's knowing good and evil. It's God's word. It's His command. That's what this poster is here for, to remind me... And you, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's the Word of God. I don't bow down to this, and I don't worship this. It's not an idol. But there's still people that keep attacking me, saying, this is an idol. It's not. That's because they don't love God's Word. They hate God's Word. And oftentimes they'll attack it. It's, it's make, got mistakes here. You get falling into the foolish questions again. People asking questions just to ask questions, to get into debates, to get into arguing, backbiting, and so forth. You know, uh, whisperings, uh, gossip, you know, deception uh, that are oftentimes lies. When you hit gossip, it's gone around so much, it's not even close to the original story. You know, you hear now that the people are trying to say uh, King James was a sodomite. No, he wasn't. 
I forgot how many kids he had, like 10 or 11 kids. He's not a sodomite. But that comes around, the whispering and everything, and the backbiting, and, and, and everything. All to attack this book. This is the Word of God, brothers and sisters in Christ. You need to hold on to it. You need to cling to it. You need to be starting every day with this book, and you need to end every day with this book. We'll get into that with the sword, but you've got to keep that sword sharp, and you've got to be trained on how to use that sword. That's what dispensational teaching is. If you've never gone through that, uh, King James Video Ministries, Brother Brian does some good teachings on dispensational teaching. I don't know if uh, uh, Peter Ruckman had some, but I know I learned from Brother Brian at King James Video Ministries. Uh, Peter Ruckman was like way before my time and as far as when he initially did most of his ministry. And I started to watch some of his videos in the last few years. But he's got some good things. How to use the sword. Okay, you have to, the Bible says, 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. How do you use the sword? You have to rightly divide. There's divisions in the Bible. Okay, everything's written for us, but not everything is written to us. Okay? I don't have to do sacrifices like two turtle doves every time I have a child. I don't have to take two turtle doves to be sacrificed. Okay? And so forth. So we see there, there's, there's that thing, if you keep my command. If you're going to be a soldier for Jesus Christ, a soldier takes commands and follows them. Today, it's such rebelling against God. I mean, we say feminism, is this, the Bible says that feminism is the sin of witchcraft. What is feminism and witchcraft? It's women rebelling against God. But men as a whole, men and women as a whole, are rebelling against God. The authority that God has over them is what they're rebelling against. That whole thing about how dare you tell me what to do. No man tells me what to do. I remember uh, the study, I forgot what the study was called, but they were talking about how you belong to Jesus Christ. It was under, another brother was doing the study, how you belong to Jesus Christ. You're a bondservant to Jesus Christ. Feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Okay? You belong to Jesus Christ. And there was people making comments, I don't belong to nobody. Nobody owns me. I'm my own man. I'm my own woman. Nobody owns me. You're not a soldier for Jesus Christ if you don't belong to the Lord. And a soldier takes commands. Part of belonging to him is you take commands and you follow them. Okay? Now here's the question that I'll ask. I'm going to say this. You can be a Christian and not have a heartfelt desire to obey God's commands? Question mark. That's what they're telling people today. You can be a Christian and not have a heartfelt desire to obey God's commands. You don't have to obey God's commands. You don't have to do it. That's works-based salvation, the changed life. God tells you to abstain from all appearance of evil. You don't have to do that. Don't listen to those Bible-believing, God-fearing men and women out there. And you stop and those of us who are saved are like, our heartfelt desire, I was nothing and God saved me. That old man is dead and buried with Christ. Crucified with Christ. That's why it says to take up your cross daily. Reminding yourself that that old man is crucified with Christ. You're now a new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay. Turn to Mark chapter 1 verse 27. Mark 1 27. When you hear this, this i got to remember where I'm at in the notes. You can be a Christian and not have a heartfelt desire to obey God's commands. You can be a Christian and not obey God's commands. Let's, I'm going to read a couple of verses here. Uh, I'm going to read them from here, but you can pause the video and turn to them. Mark 1.27 And they were all amazed insomuch that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? What thing is this? What new doctrine is this? For what authority commandeth he even the unclean spirits, and they do obey him? Let that sink in. The devils, the demons, Satan, who rebelled against God, he commands them, and they obey him. Turn to Luke 8.25. And he said unto them, Where is your faith? 
And they being afraid wondered, saying one to another, What manner of man is this? For he commandeth even the winds and waters, water, and they obey him. So let me get this straight. The demons obey him. All of creation, as far as nature and everything, obeys him. He's given man free will. That's why man doesn't obey him. He's given man free will. But you're saying you're a Christian, but the only group of people that don't obey God are the ones who have rejected him. How does that work? Okay. I mean, brothers and sisters of Christ, it's just, maybe, I don't know, Say, uh, make, make some comments in the comment section when it comes to that. The devils and the demons, two different words, devils, demons, and Satan, and even all of nature. You read that throughout the Bible, God controls nature. It does what He tells Him to do. It obeys and He commands, and they obey. Yet you're supposed to be one of His, but you don't have to keep His commandments. But you're one of His, but you don't have to keep His commandments. That makes no sense. Why? Because that's anti-Scripture. That goes against Scripture. Anybody who's truly saved, born again, says that goes against who I am now, the new man. To say that you can be a Christian and you don't have to obey, abide by any of God's commands. You can pick and choose what you want to follow and throw out the rest. You're not a soldier for Jesus Christ. Okay? You're a fake, you're a fraud. You're trying to be a counterfeit. Okay. First command, now we're going to get into this. First command is to obey the gospel. Romans 10, 16.